Yes, selling a car can be an absolutely miserable experience. Uh, I'm selling one right now and that's the response I got from one chap who thought that it shouldn't even actually be started uh, because it hadn't, has its, hadn't had its IMS bearing replaced. So I thought it was time we talked about the IMS bearing and just separated the bullshit from you know the facts that are out there and actually there aren't too many facts out there it's difficult to gauge the size of the problem uh, it's difficult to know how many cars it's happened to and it's difficult to know who to believe uh, in my case I have a perfectly serviceable car that's been pampered with oil changes and yet uh, to some people it's like having bubonic plague uh, they won't come within 15 feet of me so let's have a quick look at uh, what the IMS bearing is, who you think you should be able to believe, uh, look at some of the bullshit and some of the facts that aren't facts or people that you maybe have a, an ulterior motive uh, and uh, see if we can't figure some of this out together, shall we? Uh, but firstly, let's have a look at what the IMS bearing is and what it does and where it sits and what the issue is. <laughs> So, going through the centre of your engine is an intermediate shaft which goes round and round and round and it goes round uh, the bearing, the IMS bearing or intermediate shaft bearing. Now, off that intermediate shaft, the crankshaft is driven by the camshaft, camshaft by chains. It's got chains going off it, so it spins and it spins these chains. Now, if the bearing uh, destructs, self-destructs or uh, whatever happens to it, the bearings within that are metal, and metal goes everywhere, and your engine grenades. It's as simple as that. Uh, that's how it works. Now, the theory behind all this was that it's supposed to make the chains last longer. Um, but effectively, there is a little weakness in this uh, IMS bearing that sits in the middle of it. Now, the bearing came in three varieties um, over the course of the 996 and the early 997. The early 996s up to 2000 had a dual row bearing, which shared the load more effectively. The ones after 2000 and up to about 2006, so including some of the very early uh, 997s, had uh, single row bearings. And then the latter uh, 997s, they amended them again further. And though there's virtually, it's unheard of for any later and even early 997s, to really have any problem. So that, that, that is what we're talking about here, is this little bearing uh, that is going round and round and round and if uh, it is self-lubricated, that's another important thing to bear in mind. In other words, inside it, uh, it's got all the lubrication it needs for its lifetime. Um, it is not oil fed, uh, even though it is permanently more or less submersed in oil, in engine oil, because of where it is in the engine. Uh, so Let's next talk about what happens uh, in order to make it grenade uh, and see if we can separate the wheat from the chaff there. Now, I'm going to preface this section by saying quite obviously, I am not an engineer or a mechanic. You've seen my efforts, uh, amateurish efforts of trying to repair my Boxster, more of which soon. Uh, I am not a mechanic or an engineer. So I have researched this and I've looked into this. I have been running my YouTube channel for over two years now. I've had uh, my uh, 911 Carrera uh, C2 for two years now. I'm well aware of what the issues are, but I'm not a mechanic. And part of the problem is you should be careful about who you listen to, but we'll get to that in a moment. So, how do these things blow up in the first place? The truth is, as far as I can tell, I'm not a mechanic, you know, that in the comments below, you're going to get about a million mechanics telling me, oh, you're wrong, or oh, you don't know what you're talking about, I'm an expert, you're not an expert, and it's a nightmare to know who to believe. But as far as I can tell, there is nobody that really knows what, what happens here, or it's a combination of things. It is rare that the actual bearing itself is faulty. 
what mostly happens is that it is outside from the outside in these bearing these bearings erode by foreign matter overloading over pressurizing spinning too quickly that kind of stuff now i'm 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 not being precise here as you can tell uh, but let me read you something from uh, the Porsche Club of America, Oregon region, which I thought was uh, interesting. And I'll just read it word for word so you can take it as, for, you know, however you like. It is not known exactly why these bearings fail, but there are many contributing factors, including overloading, poor lubrication, long drain intervals, high fuel and moisture content in the engine oil, High oil temperatures and even operational speeds can also affect bearing life. That's why some bearings last 3,000 miles and others have lasted over 200,000 miles. One of the most common sources of trouble in bearings is wear and pitting caused by foreign particles and is responsible for 70% of all early bearing failures. So what does that mean? Well, I think that means that if you've got a car that is very well maintained and the oil that is surrounding that IMS bearing is clean, uh, then you've got a better chance that your IMS bearing is going to last. So you, one of the things you will hear is people saying to you, oh, well, the cars that have got a lower mileage are ones that are ones to worry to worry about. And, to, you know, they're the ones that could go bang even more susceptible to IMS trouble. Well, that's not really true. Um, it may be true. But what they're saying there, actually, I think, is that if you haven't changed the oil regularly, uh, then you are more likely uh, to be susceptible to some kind of damage. So how often does this happen and what is the extent of the damage and how can we tell? Well, that's super hard. There are very, very few facts out there. And here are the two reasons why you should be careful about who you listen to. One, lawyers. Uh, this did get, uh, this was subject to litigation. Uh, Eisen versus Porsche is the court case that you should look at. Uh, there was a class action lawsuit for cars and only cars between 2001 and 2005, which was concluded in 2013. And it only allowed uh, owners of cars uh, with trouble in their first 10 years of the car's life to claim on it. Now, bear in mind it was concluded in 2013 and my car, for example, is a 2003. The moment that that class action lawsuit uh, was concluded, my car wasn't even part of it, had I owned it from new, which I obviously didn't. Uh, so firstly, the lawsuit itself was kind of pointless and kind of useless. It didn't help too many people. But secondly, part of this uh, is that the lawyers that brought that class action lawsuit, I understand from my research, made $950,000, just the lawyers. So limited number of Porsche owners that were really helped. Um, but as part of the discovery of that court case, the lawyers in that court case, take them for what, you know, if you want to believe a lawyer who's making $950,000, it's up to you. Might be right, might not be. But the stats that came out of that was that the early cars, the pre-2000s, uh, less than, or I think the phrase was significantly less than, 1% of cars were affected. The cars that were subject to the lawsuit, uh, which I think is 2001 to 2005, and remember this is not the Metzger engine, GT3s, turbos, because they're a different engine completely. So it's the Carreras, Carrera 4Ss, 8% um, they say. Now, those, those are the first set of people that I would be very careful about listening to, uh, because they have an ulterior motive, right? Uh, they have some stats. Uh, inevitably, those people are trying to make a case against Porsche uh, and Porsche settled. Uh, it didn't come to court. So you can make a, a, you know, a case for saying how rigorously was this information tested and probed. Now, the fact that Porsche settled recognised that there was a problem and there is a problem. Uh, but is it really 8% of cars? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Secondly, you will find another batch of people who are out there to sell you something. Now, that's not to say they haven't got good products. They do have very good products. And in fact, in my opinion, the only way to solve this problem is by one of those products, which is to have an oil-fed bearing. So regardless of whether um, you know, the bearing comes apart, in fact, in this case, it can't come apart, um, 
the oil is continuously being fed. It takes a little bit of oil uh, from, the, from the engine oil uh, and routes it directly to the bearing so it's continuously fed by oil. So, and there are no spinning metal parts uh, in there, spinning, you know, little boil, uh, be uh, ball bearings in there that are going to go in your engine and blow up. But the person that sells you a solution is motivated to do so by money. So take it with a pinch of salt as to whether this is likely to happen to you. They will tell you that it happens a lot. And of course, they're right as far as they are concerned, because they are there fixing that problem, providing engines for grenaded uh, 996 engines. That's what all they see. That's what they work on. Um, but they are skilled engineers. Uh, they do know what they're talking about. Uh, and they will sell you some good products. Uh, but, as I say, they're motivated in a way that allows them to make money. So more power to them. Um, but for us people who are selling cars and buying cars, take it with a pinch of salt. And those products, as I say, are really good. And you could make a strong case for saying, well, if I'm in there replacing my clutch or my rear main seal, RMS, uh, then why not I just throw a new bearing in? Absolutely do it. Uh, good preventative maintenance. Um, if you've got a manual gearbox car, it doesn't cost too much to do. Why not? Why not go and do that? But here's the thing. If you're putting in a bearing which is of similar design to the original one uh, and not keeping on top of main other maintenance and so on and so forth, a car that's had this done four years ago is just likely to just as likely to go pop as one that's never had it done. Uh, so again, take that with a pinch of salt. Cars that you know you see advertised on cars and bids or anywhere, IMS replaced, you think, oh well good, that's that taken care of. No. Uh, it's just as likely to go pop if you don't know what kind of bearing it was uh, than, uh, than, than the original car. So why would you bother giving that any credibility at all? If it's got the IMS solution, which is an LN engineering product, LN engineering product, um, that's the one I would think, ah, now that really has been taken care of correctly. Uh, but if it hasn't, then you're just as likely as anybody else, including the car that I'm selling now, which is a perfectly functional car. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it, um, but people won't. Some people are saying that it shouldn't even be started uh, because it hasn't had its IMS bearing changed. C clearly, completely, complete nonsense. So uh, you've got a car that is now. I've got a car that is now 19 years old. Uh, we are now uh, getting on for nine years from the class action lawsuit. Uh, there's also a strong argument which says if it was going to go pop, if it was going to blow up. It would have done by now. Seems reasonable to me. Uh, I, I can't see a flaw in that argument. Uh, now, as I say, preface that by saying, if you're in there anyway, replacing rear main seals and clutches and what have you, by all means change it. It's good preventative maintenance. Uh, you are, for it, unless you're putting in the IMS solution, you are potentially reducing your risk. And there are different kinds of bearings as well. The oil fed one that I mentioned is the best one in my opinion. Um, there are other ones which are also oil fed but have also the spinning uh, metal ball bearings inside. Not quite so good in my opinion but just my opinion. The armchair mechanics below that you probably should ignore uh, will possibly tell you different. There are ceramic bearings as well and that means uh, really that the ceramic bearings, if I understand it correctly, need less lubrication and therefore are less susceptible to get pop don't know um, but that's how I that's how I view it you know my car is now 19 years old it is a pampered pet of a car uh, oil changes throughout its life um, really everything works on it it's really nice example of a car I don't feel that I'm really particularly very much at risk um, now here's the thing risk 
I, I'm actually an insurance guy, would you believe? Um, yeah, I'm a massively interesting person to meet at, par at parties. Um, but risk is all about your attitude to risk. You know, are you risk averse or not? If you are risk averse, then my recommendation to you would be to get it changed and have that enjoy that peace of mind. Uh, if you're not risk averse, um, then think about it logically in the way that I've uh, the way that I've you know set it out to you, um, and and just enjoy life because life is too short to worry about these things. But it is a case of frequency and severity. We don't know how often these things happen. But once they do happen, it's a complete failure. And by that, I mean your engine is done. You have to replace your engine. So that is the effect of, um, you know, a, 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 an IMS bearing going bad. So, you know, it doesn't, it, the chances of it happening, in my opinion, based on all the things that we've talked about, you know, the fact that, that it's probably its most highest, it's an 8% likelihood or a 92% likelihood of not happening. Um, uh, over 19 years, uh, you know, if it was going to go pop, it probably would have gone pop. Um, this has been a well-maintained car. All those things tend to mitigate me towards thinking it's much uh, greatly unlikely to happen. But if it did happen, it would be catastrophic for that engine. doesn't mean to say it's catastrophic for the car, though. And the way I view it is that, you know, there are ways of um, putting in another engine or I quite fancy the idea of doing an LS swap. I saw a Cayman at Simply Porsche in Bewley in the UK last year with a bloody great big V8 in it. And I thought, yeah, if my IMS bearing goes, that's what I'm going to do. But, you know, that's 25, 30 grand and that might not be your thing. But if you are worried about that level of risk, you probably shouldn't buy a 996. I agree with you. You know, you probably shouldn't. And, and don't inquire about my car if that is the case, because as I pointed out, if an, IMS, if an IMS bearing has been changed, that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, there is only one permanent solution, in my opinion. That's the IMS solution by LN Engineering. I am not sponsored by them. They pay me nothing. I don't even know them uh, at all. Uh, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, I hope that gives you some information on which to base your decisions with the IMS bearing and the M96 engine, M97 engine. Uh, although the M97 hugely unlikely to go pop uh, by virtue of the IMS issue. Um, come and buy my car. You'll love it. There is no other reason not to get into a, a 996. They are wonderful cars to drive. Uh, super performance, faster than any 911 that came before it in Carrera form, by some margin, uh, I should say. They make a wonderful noise. They're easy to use. They're sporting. They look great, in my opinion. I think the looks have really come into themselves. All this nonsense about, oh, it doesn't, hasn't got the bug-eyed the bug -eyed, uh, front lights. Who cares? It's a Porsche 911. Enjoy it for what it is. Thanks for listening, friends. I will see you in the next one.